So um, this honour is one of two options available to those completing the guide curriculum. It's the level two honour and it was introduced in 1972. And this honour deals with the world in which we live and what we can do to make our natural environment a better place to live. There are nine requirements for this honour. You're going to learn about ecosystems, ecological pyramids and ecological terms such as community, ecology, food chains, conservation, ecological succession and wait for it, eutrophication I've been practicing. Then there's the hands-on parts which are constructing a diagram of a freshwater pond ecosystem, observing an animal, monitoring big city pollutants and helping improve our environment. Finally, you will reflect on what scriptures have to say about this subject. So let's begin. Requirement one, construct a diagram of a freshwater pond ecosystem. So the forest pond is filled with many forms of life called inhabitants. So let's see who's inhabiting today. We have a frog, some algae, I call it algae, but some people pronounce it algae. But I know it's someone called algae, so I don't want to call it algae. So I'll say algae. <laughs> and a lily pad. And some protozoa. Some ducks. A fish. Dragonflies. Snakes. And herons. Just looking at it, you'd think, there's that many things? Well, everything alive in the pond is eaten or at one time or another, um, or they eat. So even the broken bits and pieces of the plants and animals don't go untouched. From the very smallest to the very largest form of life in the pond, it's the same, eat and be eaten. So when constructing your diagram, you need to remember um, that there's four distinct habitats. And the four habitats are the shore. So on the shore of the pond, you'll find many plants. Some of the plants will grow above the bank. Um, some of them will grow in the water. And then you'll get some that grow in both places. And some of them will have roots under the water, but stems and leaves above the surface. And others will just grow completely underwater. And then you have the surface film. Now the surface film is about six inches of water on the pond surface. And this habitat is where many types of life exist, including mosquito larva, air breathing animals, and insects that can walk on the surface by exploiting its surface tension. Life on the surface is not limited to the animal kingdom, however. You may also find floating plants and algae there. And then we have the open water, and that's where the fish, turtles, plankton, phytoplankton, and crustaceans live. And then the bottom, you can see the animals that live in the mud. On the bottom of the pond include crayfish, dragonfly nymphs, rotifers, and bacteria. These animals feed on dead organic matter that makes its way to the bottom. Question. What other inhabitants can you think of? that um, live in a freshwater pond? Answers in the chat, please. And Pastor and Mancini, if you can uh, tell us if they have any answers. Okay, so <clears throat> let's see, we've got bacteria, we've got virus. Any other takers, any other answers? We've got dolphins, dragonflies. Okay. Anything from you? We've got sharks, germs. Oh, Freshwater yes. pond at the bottom. Germs, yes. <laughs> germs. <Okay. laughs> yep. I think that's all now. For that's now. all you've got? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, nobody says shellfish or cattail, which is like the rushes. Geese. We have painted turtle. We have duckweed and yes, crayfish. But well done. Apart from the shark, I think others are fine. Um, so, requirement two 
This is where you have to pick one mammal, one bird, one reptile and one amphibian from your home environment and for each construct a diagram of its ecological pyramid. First, we need to know what an ecological pyramid is. So, the different layers in an ecological pyramid are known as trophic layers. All ecological pyramids start with a primary producer. The largest number of organisms is at this level, which is why it makes the base of the pyramid. Animals that eat the primary producers are called primary consumers. Animals that eat the primary consumers are called secondary consumers. Animals that eat secondary consumers are called tertiary consumers. So each consumer is typically larger than the prey being consumed. The higher the trophic level in the pyramid, the fewer organisms will be present. Now the purpose of an ecological pyramid is to demonstrate the reduction in biomass or energy as the food chain moves between the primary producers to the different levels of consumers. The consumer at each trophic level is usually larger in size than the trophic level being consumed. Predators, for example, are usually larger than the prey they feed upon. Such increase in size of the individual organisms strictly limits the number of successive trophic levels in a food chain. This larger size means that each successive trophic level will support fewer numbers of organisms, as you can see. As we look in the next slide, we can see for the animal ecological pyramid, at the base, we see lots of grass. Now, this is the producer. And at the next level, we see a rabbit, which eats the grass as the primary consumer. Now, rabbits breed in large numbers, therefore their numbers are not adversely affected by the fox who prey on them, as fox numbers are relatively low in comparison to rabbits. And then once the fox dies, it decomposes, fertilizes the earth, allowing the grass to grow again, to be eaten by the rabbit. And so the cycle goes on, each sustaining the other. Okay, activity for you. So, just wanna check that you're, you're understanding where I'm coming from. So, we're going to look at the other three pyramids, which is the bird, the reptile, and the amphibian. So, for the bird at the top, as the primary, no, the secondary consumer, sorry, um, we'll have a thrush. So if you put a thrush at the top of your pyramid, then I want you to think what are the other two in the um, pyramid? So your, it's primary consumer and the producer. So in the chat, once again, if you can pop that in, Mancini and Pasta will have a look and see uh, what your answers are. And we're gonna do the same for the reptile and we're gonna use a snake. And then for the amphibian, we're gonna have a frog. So, what have we got for the bird? We start with the thrush, what would we say along its, for, for its pyramid? Do you have any answers? There is uh, insects and worms. And that level is the primary consumer. And what's the producer? What's the primary producer? Okay, we're waiting. Worms. Uh, Mancini, have you got anything over yonder? There is plants. Okay, plants have just appeared. Fantastic. Um, yeah, nothing on my side. Although there is, there is a question there when they say, oh, are all producers plants? Are all producers <laughs> plants? Well, mm. primarily they are because the sun starts off the ecosystem and the sun actually... Um, it starts the process and it's generally plants as producers but don't forget about our um, plankton and our um, protozoa because they come in big numbers and they are also classed as producers. Okay. Okay, any more for the bird? Nothing on my side there, Wendy. Nothing here too. Okay, so we've got generally thrush, snails and plants. So that was good. What about the snake? Okay, what about snake? Pathfinders, what do you think? What does the snake eat? Uh, anybody, what does snake eat? Mouse? Mice? Very good. And what do mice eat? Uh, 
I, okay, cheese, cheese. Cheese, I knew it. I could I was waiting for someone to say cheese. <laughs> <laughs> cheese is not a um, natural resource. <laughs> it is a processed resource made by man. So somebody speak shrews. Shrews. <laughs> yes, shrews, brilliant. And what do they eat? <laughs> Insects, nuts. Fantastic. Oh, That's right. Seeds. We've got um, nuts, those things, yes. We've got Shelly on uh, Facebook saying frogs, saying snake eat frogs. Snakes eat frogs, okay, mm -hmm. but what do frogs eat? I've got here Lies. a rat. What's, what's Shelly put for that one, sorry? Oh no, that she hasn't responded on oh, that. Right. Okay. Just, there's, a, there's an answer on Zoom saying flies. Flies, mm. that works. Yeah, that will work <laughs> in context, yes. Brilliant. So. For snakes, you can have snake, mouse, and seeds, or you can have snake, frog, and flies. So what about the tree frog? What, what about tree the tree frog? Do we know what tree frogs eat? Berries. It says uh, insect, berries, insect, and bugs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, you're getting it. Tree frogs generally eat shrimp, and shrimp, what do shrimp eat? Wait, 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 Wendy. You, you say tree frog eats shrimp. Where is going to get shrimps on the tree? I know. Don't call <laughs> by the title. Sometimes the <laughs> name does not actually mean the habitat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, somebody said, get eaten by tree snake. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what does uh, the... <laughs> we've got, we've got right, a, a suggestion of plankton. Plankton. Fantastic. We're getting there. Plankton or algae. Yes. Very good. Algae. Okay. Uh, yes. So you're getting, the, you're getting the idea of the um, pyramid. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> we'll move on to requirement three. So now we're going to go through the terms. The terminologies. So the first term is ecology. Now ecology is the study of plants and animals in relation to each other and to their surroundings. For example, ecology may be the study of a single organism, so the study of a single turtle, including what it eats and where it eats. It may also be the study of an entire species, so the study of all turtles in freshwater ponds, including how they breed and rise and fall in numbers. Ecology can also be the study of an entire ecosystem. So the study of all organisms in a freshwater pond, including how they interact with each other. The community, total of living organisms having mutual relationships among themselves and to their environment, or groups of organisms in an area that interact or depend on each other for survival. For example, in this picture of the field ecosystem, we have the plants, the animals, the sun, rain, all playing a part in ensuring the organism's survival by relying and interacting with each other. Then we have the food chain. Now this is the transfer of food energy from one organism to another. For example, grass is consumed by the grasshopper, who is consumed by the bluebird, who is consumed by the snake, who is consumed by an owl, who on death is consumed by fungi, which returns to the grass, and then the cycle continues. Now, removing any of the organisms in the chain will cause an imbalance that may affect all of the other organisms. Then we have commensalism, the relationship between two organisms where one benefits and the other neither benefits nor is harmed. For instance, in the top picture, we can see a barnacle. Barnacles attach to the side of whales and have a commensal relationship. The barnacle benefits and the whale is neither helped nor harmed. Barnacles are filter feeders waving feather appendages in the water to collect small food. Barnacles only attach themselves to whales as hitchhikers, but do not feed on the whale. In the bottom picture is a whale with barnacles attached. 
single humpback whale may carry up to 450 kilograms of barnacles, or 990 pounds. Ecological succession. Now, members of a community, by their very activities, tend to change the environment. After a period of time, they make the habitat unfit for themselves. So the organisms then die out or migrate elsewhere, but they have made the environment fit for other kinds of plants and animals. A different kind of community develops in place of the old one. This kind of gradual but continuous change is called ecological succession. For example, in the Australian outback, where forest fires regularly destroy the forested areas, after only a few days, small plants take advantage of the absence of the forest to grow. When further time has passed, they are replaced by shrubs, which are replaced or are eventually joined by regrown or new trees to restore the community to its original state. Well, here's our plankton. The microscopic animals and plant life found floating in bodies of water, which are used as food by fish and water mammals. For example, Although plankton is microscopic, it is in such abundant supply that it is the sole diet of the largest whale. Conservation, the wise use of natural resources. Okay, I'm gonna need your help again here. So conservation is about using resources in a best possible way to prolong their supply and maximize use. What ways can we Conserve water. Answers in the chat. Okay, what ways can we save water? Can we get those fingers typing? Okay. <clears throat> All right, don't leave the tap running. Repair okay. leak taps. Brilliant. Turn off the tap, use a water bottle. Yep. Mm. That's coming yeah. through the pipes. What about when we go campery? Where's our biggest waste of water? And no, I'm not talking about the water pipes. When we go campery, what's our biggest waste of water? <laughs> Play. <Show>. Plain. Plain. <laughs> <laughs> knew they'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the showers instead of baths. Very good. Use water for more than one purpose. Use shower once a day. Filter the water. Mm. Um, um, in Facebook, we've got uh, fix, fix forces and leaks. Uh, yeah. Wash car with a hose uh, or with a bucket. I think bucket. that's what Shelley's trying to say. Um, uh, Zilois is saying, don't fill baths to brim. <laughs> okay. Brilliant. What about when you're brushing your teeth? Does I I I've got something that might help actually. Go on. Um, let me see if you see this. What is that? Oh, hold on. Can you see that? Oh, a timer. Yeah. Yeah. How's that? Okay. You can well, use that, isn't it? Using a timer. Mm. Yeah? And don't have the tap on whilst you're brushing your teeth on using the timer. <laughs> Turn the tap on. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. So now we're on climax community. Now this term isn't really used much anymore. Um, as ecologists have found the theory with its many coined terms difficult to apply because they're dissatisfied with how it compared to observed individual organisms and because better theories have developed. However, the term has become a bit popular amongst theoretical ecologists. Now, the term is used to express a community in its final stage of succession. As you can see in the diagram, in the first picture, the plant grows yearly and is succeeded by grasses and perennials. And then in the second picture, we see the shrubs, pines and young oak and hickory beginning to grow. And with time, they become mature and stable, as can be seen in the third picture, until the next disturbance occurs to restart the cycle. 
Neutral vacation. Okay, now this is when the number of plants in a body of water becomes so numerous that they start to remove more oxygen from the water than they can produce. Without sufficient oxygen, the animal species begin to die, allowing even more plants to grow. This generally occurs when large amounts of nutrients, namely nitrogen and phosphorus, enter the system through runoff, usually from agriculture. And a symptom of eutrophication is an algae bloom, which you can see on the um, diagram there. The biome. Now, this is a community of plants and animals that have common characteristics for the environment they exist in. They can be found over a range of continents. For example, in the pictures here, we have a temperate grassland or shrub land biome, known commonly as steppe in Central Asia, prairie in North America, and pampas in South America. They all look the same, don't they? Well, simply put, it's a large distinct territorial region with similar climate, soil, and organisms, regardless of its global location. So on to requirement four. Now, here's your opportunity to observe an animal in your own environment. So you choose what you want to observe, and then here's a, an example of how to fill out the log. Um, and this will be found on page four of your workbook. And you can add photos or drawings to your log. You could do a video log if you wanted to, um, so that you can show uh, your observations of the animal in your environment. So as you can see, you date it, you put the time, you put down what you've observed, and then you put down what you've seen. And um, I don't know if you're, um, with the RSPB, every year they do um, a bird watch um, for two days, and you can actually take part in that, and that's part of doing this. They send you all the information, you just register, they give you all the forms, you just tick. They even give you a poster with all the birds on, so all you have to do is tick what's in your, what you see in your area. And that's going to be a way to start doing that kind of um, ecological um, observations. It's really good. I think it's called Bird Watch. Okay, requirement five. Now, this is where we you took some definitions of what an ecosystem is. Now, you've learned a lot about ecosystems, so I'm hoping you'll be able to um, write up your definition um, and state what you understand of what it is. When you're doing your definition, just remember a few things, that an ecosystem is a community of living things and the environment in which they live, be that a coral reef, a desert, a rainforest or grassland, each has its own unique ecosystem. Almost all ecosystems gain their power from the sun. A balanced ecosystem has a steady number of producers and consumers, and predators keep the prey population in check without killing them all. And so what keeps an ecosystem in balance? We've mentioned about the predators. So um, animals and plants have a range of physical conditions to which they are suited. This typically is some physical requirements such as shelter, food, water or air. As can be seen here, the puffin ecosystem is quite diverse. And then we have the emu. They are both birds but they live in very different ecosystems. The emu has relatively few predators, namely eagles and dingoes, whereas the puffin as many more. The balance to be maintained, all organisms in the community need to interact in an environment that suits their range of tolerance. The removal of a single species from an ecosystem can have a huge impact in the entire community. So requirement six. Now here's your chance to research your local community. Now I'm from the West Midlands. West Midlands. So I'll be looking at details from that area, okay? But you can get it from um, your local 
council's website. So if you live in Manchester, Kent, you can get stuff from that area. But I'm going to be dealing mostly with the West Midlands. So we have a graph which shows how much waste is disposed of in the seven councils in the West, in the country. Now, can you see which council has the most waste per person per week? You pop the answer in the chat so we can see if you can understand the graph. So who has the most waste per person per week? Okay, Pathfinders, who has the most? Wolverhampton. <laughs> Somebody says Wolverhampton. <laughs> Solihull. <laughs> Solihull. Okay. Solihull. Uh, the 3 1. The 3 1. Okay, Birmingham. Okay, listen, it's per person per week. Per person per week. We'll try again. Okay, um, so yeah, so we've got those Wolverhampton, Solihull, and Birmingham. Okay, and uh, we've got Solihull on Facebook as well. <coughs> and the answer is Solihull. Well done, not Wolverhampton. Did you put Wolverhampton in Mancini? No, I didn't. <laughs> Wolverhampton. <laughs> <laughs> Although I would have said Wolverhampton, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Well done. Now, who has the highest residual household waste per household? So who has the highest residual household waste per household? Okay. Birmingham, Birmingham, Birmingham City, Birmingham. Well done. <laughs> You're getting it. Fantastic. Brilliant. Are the um, Facebook guys on, on track there? Um, no, nothing's come through yet. Okay. And so, all, who, final, final chance now to get another one right, and who has the lowest collected household waste per person? The lowest collected household waste. Come on, Pathfinders. Who's got the lowest? Birmingham, Birmingham. <laughs> it's Birmingham. It's very interesting. Yeah? But you weren't expecting that, guys. It's uh, very interesting. I think, I mean, I've got Birmingham on my side, but I think it will answer both the last two questions anyway. Oh, fantastic. Brilliant. So that's what the graphs would look like. Okay, so how can we take better care of our amount of waste? Well, we can utilize the four R's of waste minimalization. Reduce, reduce, the best way to reduce is to don't have it in the first place. So if we can prevent its generation in the first place, then we've obviously reduced it and avoid unnecessary packaging and products. And, um, you know, when you go shopping, try and um, not get any extra bags, any unnecessary stuff. Pick up packages that have just got one layer rather than multiple layers. Uh, reuse. So um, I know we're very good at reusing our plastic bags. Yeah, and we were really gutted when we found we had to pay for them, but uh, plastic bags, very good way to reuse, and any other things that we can't um, that we can't reduce, we should try and reuse, like boxes and things like that. And we have recycling. So if we can't reuse it, then we should be able to recycle it. Um, just an interesting point: M and S actually recycles all their plastic. Um, and turns it into the plastic bags that you use to do your shopping with. So that's a good way of recycling. I'm not plugging m and I'm just aware that this is what they do. <laughs> yeah, and you also have examples where um, plast recycling plastic is turned into playground equipment or for vegetation into compost. 
Um, and so there's other things that you can recycle, like your bottles, cardboard, steel, plastic, and glass. Um, way back in the old days, you could actually bring your bottles back to the shop and you used to get money for it. So, uh, and that was because they were glass bottles. So um, recycling used to be done in the past. It's not a new thing. Um, and refuse. So when you can't get rid, you can't recycle it, you can't reduce it, um, and you can't reuse it, then that should be disposed of properly. So no fly tipping, don't throw it away inappropriately. It should be put into the proper disposable um, units. Okay. On to requirement seven. Sorry. This is our last but one hands-on experience. And this is where you're going to have to do a bit of internet research, but you're also going to have to be very vigilant because you're going to be looking out for some things. Measuring air pollution. So different chemicals can cause air pollution. And in the past, the main air pollution problem was high levels of smoke and sulfur dioxide emitted following combustion of sulfur containing fossil fuels, such as coal used for domestic and industrial purposes. These days, the major threat to clean air is now posed by traffic emissions. Petrol and diesel engine motor vehicles emit a wide variety of pollutants, principally carbon monoxide, which is CO. As you can see on the graph, it's a big green one. Oxides of nitrogen or nitrogen oxide, volatile organic compounds, VOCs, and particulate matter, PM, which have an increasing impact on urban air quality. In addition, pollutants from these sources may not only prove a problem in the immediate vicinity of these sources, but can be transported long distances. Photochemical reactions resulting from the action of sunlight in nitrogen dioxide and VOCs typically emitted from road vehicles lead to the formation of ozone. Ozone is a secondary pollutant which often impacts rural areas far from the original emission site as a result of long range transport. Because of the high levels of pollutants from cars, there's been a need to set up air pollution monitors around certain cities. Now this meter is in Haringey, and this one is in Liverpool. There are also monitors in Birmingham and other major cities. Look out for them when you're next out and about. Now pollution is not only bad for the environment, it's also bad for your health. Just before you continue, yeah? somebody's uh, wondering the word refuse because um, can you explain? Because I think it's, it's, it's got exactly. dual meaning. It's actually, it's, it's for like, you know, um, waste matter. It's just re refuse. I think they just wanted to get another R in. But yeah, because I, I find that word very hard. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, waste stuff that you can't, you can't get rid of by any other means. It has to go to landfill. Um, sometimes, like, if you, you should try and compost if you can, food waste that might go, or you've got some um, electrical equipment that you can't get rid of, um, you can't break down, that may go there as well. Um, sulfurs, beds, things like that. Don't throw them into the alleyway, take them to the sink, things like that. Does that help? Yes, you can proceed, yeah. Okay, so um, we're looking at um, our health as well. So um, the environment may be polluted, but also it can um, affect our health. Um, but not only just air pollution, there's also water pollution and soil contamination. So these are all things we should be aware of and they can have um, major, they can affect all the major organs, um, your heart, your lungs, your stomach, all those different systems could be affected. So it's important for us to um, look after our environment. So when you've actually completed your research on air pollution, you're required to produce a chart showing your findings. 
So this can be in any format that you like, um, that you can do, as long as you can explain it, that's the important part. So ensure that you can explain your chart. Um, so you can do a line chart, you can do a bar chart, um, so any chart, uh, just to sh uh, show your findings in regards to air pollution. Okay, so requirement eight is another opportunity for you to make a difference. This is where you're asked to list 10 ways in which you can um, improve the environment in which you live. And then you have to actually put those, put four of those into action. So, I'm gonna ask you a question, obviously. Okay. <laughs> so, what can we do? Questions are there. How can you actively improve the environment that you um, that you live in? Okay, we've we've given you some examples earlier, talking about turning the tap off when you're brushing your teeth, taking shorter showers, uh, re reducing your water waste. What other ways can we um, help to improve our environment? Okay can put your answers in the chat right here or in Facebook chat. What ways can we do? Dispose of rubbish. Dispose of rubbish. With that. Fantastic. Any other answers, Pathfinders? In what way can you improve the environment in which you live? What else can we do? I, I'm thinking of um, we've got um, pick rubbish uh, from Zidloy, so, mm -hmm. um, from Good. Facebook. Brilliant. Someone else has said mend your clothes instead of throwing them away. Oh yeah. Or maybe uh, or maybe passing them on to somebody else who could use them, like a um, a, a relative, a, a smaller cousin or something who could use them. That's good. Uh, we've got Sol uh, Facebook saying that uh, you know, tear turn on your car right when you are going to leave, instead of just leaving it on. Uh, Running, well done. Yeah. I like that. Mm. Make sure things are clean, mm. or make sure we clean, uh, as as Eloisa said after. There is the recycling out here and rescue animals. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Mm. Yeah. Not littering. Not littering. Very good. Yeah. Mm. Yes, when people are disposing of their face masks and gloves and things, unfortunately, we're seeing yeah. lots of those lying around. That, I think that's we're... true, Nat. Yeah, I've seen that as well. Yeah. yeah. So we just dispose of rubbish responsibly, I think, is a good, mm. Mm. Very good. thing. Very good. Okay. We can also plant trees. We can always do gardens. Things like that can also help. Okay. So you need to think of some ways and things that you can actually do. What about the three, four R's? Do we all remember what the four R's are? The four R's, does anybody remember? The four R's? There was reduced. Uh, reuse, refuse, and recycle. Someone's put them all in one line. That's cool. Anybody else? Does anybody dispute this? <laughs> anybody, can anybody do them in order? Reduce, reuse, recycle, and refuse. That's another one. Brilliant. Yeah. Good. So you're all getting it. You all, you all know what's happening here. All right, we're going to go for the last question, which you, are, you all had time to um, get the answer to. And what's the major threat to clean air these days? What is the major threat to clean air? Cars emitting gas, factories and smoking. So you've got two. Cars emitting gas or factories and smoking. Somebody else, factories and smoking. Anything on the Facebook here? Uh, nothing so far. Hmm. No, we, 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 we're getting the, 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 R's, the answers to your R's. Oh, oh how's it um, doing with the R's? 
Yeah, but no, actually, we've got some answers coming through. Smoking pollution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pastor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? The most major, the major threat at the moment is traffic pollution, but we are trying to address that with the uh, clean cars, and a lot of people are now. Um, re um, trying to reduce their CO2 emission and also replacing using trees to um, to repair that as well, planting trees. So yes, okay. Well, an interesting answer here from a yeah. uh, colleague Mate on Facebook saying people coughing and not covering as a major threat to clean air. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm thinking COVID here, is it? I like that. That's a very good answer. Very good. It's very relevant. Okay. But when you've done that, remember to dispose of your mask appropriately and responsibly. Responsibly. Thank you. Okay. So, finally, we're going to consider... Um, what the Bible has to say, okay? So, first we should consider the sustainability of our actions. Now, each scripture you can read um, at your, in your time, um, but I will go through as much as I can. So Deuteronomy 22, six to seven. If a bird's nest happens to be before you, you shall not take the bird with the young. You shall surely let the mother go and take the young for yourself that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days. The word sustainable describes a practice that meets present needs without jeopardizing the ability to meet future needs. It may be a recent buzzword, but the concept was emphasized long ago in the Bible. From the beginning, God commissioned man to tend and keep his, his environment. Genesis chapter 2, 15. God wanted his people to be circumspect. Deuteronomy 32, 29. Avoid greed, Proverbs 1, 19. Plan for the future, 2 Corinthians 12, 14. And take care of the world around them, Proverbs 12, verse 10. As we read in Deuteronomy 22, 67, he taught them to leave the mature generation to greed again. If they found a bird with young, never to take both. Other passages also relate to sustainability. The Israelites were to responsibly manage their land at regular intervals, letting it rest in a natural fallow. Leviticus 25 verses 2 to 7. Even in war, the children of Israel were to take the long view. They were forbidden to destroy their enemies' fruit trees. Deuteronomy 2020. After all, God designed ecosystems to satisfy the needs of a vast array of organisms, and he seems to delight in them all. Job 38. 27, 26 to 27, and Job 39. He does not smile on thoughtless destruction of his creation. Revelation 11, 18. In short, the Bible describes and requires sustainable practices. Although modern life can pose different challenges, the ecological principles of the Bible are just as relevant in today's quest for sustainability. It makes a difference what meat you eat. If you must eat meat, then it does make a difference. Leviticus 11, 2, speaks to the children of Israel saying, these are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. You can also see Deuteronomy 14, 3 to 20 and Genesis 7, 2. In short, the Bible describes and requires sustainable practices. Although modern life can pose different challenges, the ecological principles of the Bible are just as relevant in today's quest for sustainability. Although meat does have proteins and nutrients, um, and it does have its advantages, the Bible says that God provided for humans to consume animals as the green herb, Genesis 9, 3. Yet, in the same way that many plants are inedible or poisonous to humans, not all meats are equal. Not only do the muscular structures of fish, birds, and other animals differ broadly from each other, as 1 Corinthians 15, 39 notes, but even meat from apparently similar creatures can vary from relatively wholesome 
to risky based on a multitude of ecological and anatomical factors. A look at the meats God calls clean, okay for human consumption, and unclean affirms this principle. Of course, God gives laws for our good, both spiritually and physically, Deuteronomy 10, 13. Studying just the science behind each commandment cannot reveal God's higher purpose, and it certainly cannot provide a replacement for obedience. However, understanding the scientific wisdom packed in Leviticus 11 can help us appreciate that God's laws are not arbitrary, but specifically designed to fit his purpose, even if we don't fully understand it. And Genesis 3, 19, in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are and to dust you shall return. Scripture lays out a cyclical relationship between dirt and our bodies. In fact, science agrees. The chemical ingredients that make up humans and other organisms mix into the soil after decomposition. Accordingly, all the elements that make up the human body can be found in the soil. The soil, however, is not necessarily a final resting place. Some of these elements move in cycles between the atmosphere, biosphere and Earth's surface. The carbon, nitrogen and water cycles include paths for each of these chemicals to be absorbed by a plant and perhaps be consumed by an animal or series of animals before returning to the ground. Other essential elements have an even more direct route back, to, back into organisms' bodies since plants and animals obtain them directly from the earth or indirectly through the food chain. In other words, the Bible describes a cycle of life. The process of decay recycles nutrients for future generations. This fact is foundational to understanding how organisms grow and interact with their environment. It also helps us appreciate how God has a master plan and order to even the messy and unpleasant parts of his creation. Now, does the spirit of prophecy have anything to say about ecology? In Councils on Diet and Food Study Guide, it states on page 36, that meat as a primary protein source is unsustainable and from our study into ecology, ecosystems, this would appear to be true. As the top of the food chain outnumbers the rest of the food chain, and this makes an imbalance in the ecosystem, because there's lots of us and there's not so much of them. So by studying ecology, we can understand what measures are needed to keep natural communities in balance and beautiful. Any questions? Okay, Pathfinders, any questions? Okay, it seems that everything is well over here. Um, over to you, Mancini. They're just finishing. Okay. Nothing on my side there, Pastor. Okay. Okay, so. Just a reminder of the requirements. Now it's hoped that the study of ecology will help you in some way to better understand the workings of nature and thus help you to do something about the destruction of our natural resources before it's too late. And also helps you to understand that we have a creator God who cares. Thank you. Well